We are at the Bison Range on the Flathead Reservation. And we're going to go hear the story of the buffalo. And there's Pranina, our fearless leader. Oh my gosh, sure about that. revitalization project where he's taking all these youth and at the same time learning, relearning himself how to like skin oh, that's cool. how to tan the hides and how to make stuff like this. Yeah. And I was just like, I'm like, how's it going? He's like, ah, he wrecked like the first six hides. <laughs> yeah. It's like hard it's to learn hard. how to sure it's them hard. properly. Meanwhile, I work in the Natural Resources Department for the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. And today I'd like to talk just a little bit about the history, culture, and geography, which are of the tribes in relationship to the National Bison Range. Um, this provides the background for our entering into an agreement to manage resources here um, on the National Bison Range. The agreement was with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. To understand a little bit of history in order to understand why the tribes are so keenly interested in management of bison on the National Bison Range. Um, our elders tell us that bison are at the very heart of our history and culture. Um, not only did they provide um, for our shelter, our clothing, our food, our tools, but they also provided for our spiritual way of life also. And it's that deep sense of respect and our responsibility for bison that's really part of the underpinning for our, uh, our interest in management of the national If you imagine that we conservatively were in this place for approximately 12,000 years. Um, let's, let's look at this timeline and think about it as uh, a 24-hour day. You know, let's, let's wrap this 12,000 years around. We arrived at approximately 11.28 p.m. in our history. <laughs> and that Columbus arrived on this continent within the last 6% of our history. So uh, I, I want to provide a sense of time depth. And you know, it's, it's um, I find it challenging to talk about 12,000 years of history. The United States Con Constitution looks at treaties as the most solemn document between nations. And it really established our tribes as sovereign nations. That's, that's really important. And Brian's going to talk about why that's so important later. Um, there's a lot of um, I know there's a lot of confusion about the term reservation. Um, if you think about our Aboriginal territory, imagine that we reserved, that, that we lived in approximately this much area of land. So southern Canada, Panhandle of Idaho, easternmost Washington, Montana, northern part of, of Wyoming, and I'm terrible at geography too, besides states. Anyway, so this was the extent of our Aboriginal territory. So we chose to reserve approximately this much for our exclusive use and benefit and share or cede approximately this much with other people in the region. While we ceded this territory, we reserved particular rights. We reserved the right to hunt, to fish, to gather our foods and, and medicines and all of the traditional things we did for our, for our well-being. But this is, this is not land that the U.S. government gave to the tribes. This is land that we reserved for our exclusive use and, and benefit. Um, and that's incredibly important, and Brian's going to talk so, about this. So <clears throat> there's been a great deal of debate about how many bison there were on the plains. Um, no one really knows for sure, but most historians estimate that there were approximately 60 million bison on the plains. And they ranged from Canada to Mexico and California. And in 1883, bison were nearly extirpated from the wild. Um, 
1883, with the completion of the Northern Pacific Railroad, it allowed bison to be moved to Philadelphia, where there was the first commercial high buffalo hide tanning factory. This photo is taken at the Carbon Works in Michigan, and these bison skulls were ground for, uh, for fertilizer. So with the opening of tribal lands and the coming of the railroad, the ability to, um, uh, to extirpate bison from the wild was, was nearly a part of FDR's New Deal. It was the Indian portion of it. It was meant to redress some of the historical injustice. And one of the things it did was it stopped the land loss. Uh, it, it stopped the Homestead Act, and it, it stopped that. Um, but by this time, already two-thirds of the land on the reservation w was lost to, uh, to tribal ownership. Um, it, um, as I said, it was meant to redress the, um, some of the, the great injustice of the past. One of its great flaws, however, was that it eliminated traditional leaders, eliminated chiefs. Um, we were the first tribe in the nation to, to become reconstituted under the Indian Reorganization Act, and at that point we became the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, and we had an elected governing body rather than um, rather than traditional chiefs as we had as we had. That changed with what Jermaine mentioned in terms of the Indian Reorganization Act, uh, the Indian New Deal. That. Uh, legislation, although it had its drawbacks, as Jermaine pointed out, in large part was the beginning of kind of a renaissance in how tribes are viewed and treated as a matter of federal policy, more autonomy given to tribes, and a recognition that breaking up reservations and bringing in non-Indians to settle them, or trying to turn all the Indian folks into farmers by giving them allotment, was not successful and needed to stop before more damage could occur. So that was the 1930s. In the 1970s, the second, in my view, most important piece of federal legislation was passed, and that's called the Indian Self-Determination Act. For the first time, tribes were able, tribal governments were able to contract the activities of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or the Indian Health Service, and operate their own programs for their own people and their own. The Bison Range is um, part of a complex of National Wildlife Refuges that are operated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, which is part of the U.S. Department of Interior. And the other two refuges that are associated with the National Bison Range Complex are the Nine Pipe and the Pablo National Wildlife Refuges, which are actually located on tribally owned land. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the federal government, has easements to operate them. You should give up your time and your effort and your, your intellects and your fiery passion for change. And I'm, I'm so inspired. I love each and every one of y'all. I feel very grateful for having to get to know each one of you a little bit and hopefully more in the future. But thank you from the bottom of our hearts yeah. for your your presence. And that's what I just wanted to tell you all before we you know, if I don't get a chance to say it to you individually. Thank you. And thanks to Jody Ray for Jody Ray. Jody Ray.